All right, let's hope this is working. Looks like we're live here. Hello, everybody. My name is Brooks Robertson, and uh, pleasure to be here tonight doing some boom chick techniques with you. And uh, yeah, this is always a fun time to be here live on YouTube. So thanks so much for joining me. And there's a chat window. If you want to let me know that it's it's looking all right, feel free to chime in and let me know where you're you're viewing from and writing in from. And any questions you have, uh, you can ask them there in the chat window. Hey, Jim, how you doing? Uh, glad that you can join us. And yeah, let me give you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to work on. Just some basic, very basic boom chick style techniques for the right hand to develop some thumb independence. Um, and we're also going to look at some beginning patterns that will help you with the right hand dynamics, uh, dexterity, finger independence, thumb independence, all that kind of thing. And then we're going to look at a, a simple tune using the boom chick style, uh, which I can teach you a little bit of, and, and we're going to give you some some tablature and notation for that as well. And then along the way, any questions you have, feel free to ask. So it, this is always fun, and uh, we'll see how, how it goes well. So we got Jim from Tampa. Gary Knowles is in Maine. Hey, Gary. All right, cool. So let me just start off by playing you a little bit of a tune that I wrote. Uh, this is a tune that I wrote for my essentials course for True Fire, which is all about boom chick style. It's uh, 10 etudes, basically, that use boom chick techniques. So this is a tune I wrote, and uh, one of the, the main things I tried to do throughout this whole piece is keep the thumb moving, which we're going to talk about a lot tonight, because the thumb is like the, the engine that drives a lot of finger style, thumb picking style tunes. Okay, so this one... It's called Midnight Vagabond, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. I'll just play a little bit of this, and then we can dive right into some techniques and that kind of thing. Hope you heard that all right. And anyways, as I said, that's a tune that I wrote with the intention of writing a boom chick finger style tune. Um, so as we talk tonight, I can key you in on some of the things that I considered uh, when writing that tune um, in, in order to make it sound, you know, sort of authentic, I guess, to the boom chick style and also make it somewhat easy to play and fun to play. Uh, that's what it's all about, really. So we can talk about this as we go on. And I'm just going to start from kind of the ground up of some really, really basic um, boom chick style techniques that everyone should know. And so some of you may have seen these before uh, and know how to do this stuff already, but it's it never hurts to review some of this. So the first thing that's the foundation of so much of the finger style repertoire of Chad Atkins, Jerry Reed, 
Tommy Emmanuel, and so on, Tom Brash, Merle Travis, is the thumb on the picking hand. Uh, a couple of things to point out. I use a thumb pick. Um, there's all types you can use. I use a, a brand called Fred Kelly. Uh, this is what I've always used since I started playing. And yeah, I use the thumb pick, which it's not essential. You don't have to do it, but it makes a huge difference um, to get the kind of real tone and feel and sound that you want with the, with the boom chick style. So it's definitely recommended to use one. Uh, it doesn't mean it's impossible without it, but yeah, that's what I would try out. Uh, if you've never got a thumb pick or, or, or tried one, you know, order one or, or go down to your local music store and grab one. And the, the way to get into doing it is just throw one on and start experimenting with it. So, yeah, that's something to point out is the thumb pick. I also use acrylic fingernails. Um, again, this is kind of dependent on the player themselves. Um, some people like to use just the flesh of their fingertip or their natural nail uh, because I play a lot. And sometimes I play really aggressively. Uh, I like to have that the acrylic on top of the nail. So that's what I've got going on with the right hand materials, thumb pick and uh, sort of fake acrylic fingernails overlay on the top of my real nail. Um, so that's really the only, you know, sort of gear I've got on the right hand. And now let's look a little bit at the technique uh, and starting with the thumb. The thumb's going to play like our bass player's part and sort of the rhythm guitar player's part all in one in a very condensed and consolidated version. And the way that I learned all this was from my teacher, Buster B. Jones. I'm pretty much going to be teaching you the same way that uh, Buster taught me with these picking patterns and, and learning the right hand technique. OK, so I'd like to split it up into three types of alternating bass patterns. And that's dependent on what string the root of the chord is on. OK, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. But for now, uh, let's just dive right into a, a pattern with the thumb, OK? I'm going to use it like a G major chord, first position. So when I play this particular chord and shape the roots on the sixth string, which is important because I'm going to start my alternating bass pattern on the sixth string where the root is, OK? So that's going to be important. For now, I'm not using the fingers, just the thumb. And something to point out before I get started, too. Uh, you can just kind of rest your fingers if you've never done this before, just on the pick guard, or if you want to actually set them on the strings, like ring finger on the first string, middle finger on the second string, index on the third string, you can do that. We're not going to play with them yet. But what's important is the relationship between where the fingers are and the thumb. And the little trick that Buster B. Jones used to always show me was to take a pencil at a diagonal line, and your thumb should always be on one side of that pencil and fingers on the other. Uh, with some flexibility. But what you'd want to avoid is having the thumb and the fingers on the same side. Uh, we're going to run into problems there with when we get into muffling the bass strings as well as the fingers and thumb running into each other. So as a, a general rule of practice, diagonal line, thumb will be on one side of that line as it plays and the fingers will be on the other. So you always want to maintain that form. Um, the other thing with the thumb is that you, you rarely want to actually pick by bending this knuckle. Uh, sometimes you do that slightly, but more, more often than not, your thumb should be arched and you're gonna do a downstroke through the string, okay? Versus picking this way with bending the knuckle. You, we wanna stay away from that. We're gonna get a better tone and, and uh, more speed and dynamics from having kind of a rounded thumb or as straight as you can get it and playing down with the downstroke through the the string. Okay, so any questions you have so far, feel free to, to chime in on the chat. Um, otherwise, I'll keep going here. And let's get back to our G major chord. So the basic alternating pattern we're going to do is when the thumb's going to play on every beat. And for now, we're, we're in common time, which is just four, four times. So the thumb's going to play four quarter notes on every beat. It's going to play a quarter note like this. It's going to six string on beat one. Fourth string on beat two, fifth string on beat three, and the fourth string again on beat four. Okay, so it's alternating every time. It never hits two strings, the same string in a, twice in a row, I should say. So here it is if I just do a little loop of that.
So to me, that's my six string root alternating bass pattern. Okay, and again, this seems, this is very, very fundamental. This is the building block, uh, but sometimes it gets overlooked. So I think it's important to, to start out here. All right, let's take another chord where we have a root on the fifth string, like for instance, a C major in first position. So the way I'm playing this chord, my root's there on the third fret fifth string. That's the root. So I want to make sure I start the alternating pattern now on the root, on the first beat. Okay, so the fifth string alternating pattern works very similar to the sixth string, except for I'm just starting going fifth on the first beat, fourth string on the second beat, the sixth string on the third beat, and you'll notice I, I rock my ring finger down to get that G note. That's the third beat, and the fourth beat is the thumb again on the fourth string. So here it is all together. quarter notes. One, two, three, four. All right, so that summarizes the fifth string root alternating bass pattern. And then finally, we're going to do a fourth string root alternating pattern. So maybe I will take a D seventh chord, first position, using some open strings. And here, my, my root's on the fourth string. So I'm going to start the pattern on the fourth string. And that's what I, I'm trying to instill is, is every time, for now, uh, what we're talking about, we want to start the, the alternating pattern on the root. Okay, so here's what we're going to do now is thumb on the fourth string on beat one. Then it goes up to the third string on beat two. Beat three is the fifth string. Beat four is back to the third string. So what you have to do when we start to use the fingers, when you have a fourth string root pattern, those fingers, you know, originally were on the first, second, and third string, ring, middle, and index, respectively. But when we move up for a fourth string root chord, those fingers need to shift up as well. So you won't be using your ring finger. It'll be middle finger on the E string, first string, and uh, index finger on the second string for our fourth string root pattern. So here's that alternating bass with the fourth string root. nice even steady quarter notes okay so so right there we have six string root fifth string root and fourth string root alternating bass patterns and that's going to give us a lot of coverage uh, for many different types of chords that we're going to play uh, in tunes or in exercises or anything like that so let's try incorporating uh, the fingers now with that and if you've never done this before this will immediately feel very difficult, but it just takes a lot of practice. It takes time and repetition, as a lot of it is just getting the motor skills down and, and your hands used to doing it. So let's look at the G major chord first. And I'm going to use that same pattern I just had. Six, four, five, four. Those are the strings. Six string, fourth string, fifth string, fourth string. What I'm going to do now is add the index, middle, and ring finger on the second beat and the fourth beat. Okay, what's important here is to maintain the alternating pattern with the thumb. That can't stop. Thumb's got to play on every beat. So here is that pattern really slow. Pinches, I call it pinch when all three fingers and the thumb are playing together. Pinches on beats two and four. So we got one, two, three. So that's uh, an example, six string root pattern, pinching on beats two and four. And that has that sound that we're talking about throughout this whole workshop, right? Boom, chick, boom, chick, which is what the thumb is doing, okay? You'll notice I'm maintaining that, that relationship I talked about, thumb on one side of the the pencil or the line, fingers on the other at all times. Okay, let's try it on the C major chord. So it's the same thing, pinching on beats two and four with the index, middle, and ring finger. But this time I'm starting on the fifth string root. Okay, so we have this with the thumb. Okay, now I'm going to add in the pinches on beats two and four.
finally, let's do the four string root pattern. We use a D7 for this. And remember, the fingers are going to shift up. Index finger on the second string, middle finger on the first string. Okay, here's my the thumb pattern, fourth string root thumb pattern. I'm going to add in the fingers now, beats two and four. One. Anybody have any questions so far? If you're, if you want to type in any questions about what we've done, I'm glad to uh, address that. Otherwise, I'll keep chugging along here. So, again, if you've done this before, this is probably going to feel like, okay, I, I know what he's doing. What's when is this going to get exciting? Well, we're going to work up to some exciting stuff, but these are the building blocks to mention real quickly first. And if you haven't done it, um, just take that pattern itself. You know, pinches on two and four. And you can use this progression, G, C, and D7. Here's an example where I'll put all three of the chords together. Uh, and I want to have, you know, very smooth, consistent quarter notes with the thumb. All right. And now I'm going to play two bars of each chord, two bars of G, two bars of C, two bars of D7. And then I'll finish up with two bars of G. Okay. So here it is. And what I'm trying to pay attention to is making sure I start the thumb on the root of every chord on beat one. Here we go. One, two, three, four. So this pattern is on a, a sheet that, that you can download. Uh, Jeff Sheets has, has put a few links up here. Uh, you can download this sheet, which these patterns are on. It looks like this. And uh, these will help you get started with some thumb and finger independence. OK, so that's something you can utilize to practice with. The other patterns on this sheet start to vary which beats you put the pinch on, uh, which sounds easier than it is to do. So maybe I'll show you one of those here in a minute. But the next thing that's important with the boom chick style is being able to muffle the bass. Okay, and someone just asked, James just asked, is this good for Delta Blues or early country music? Yeah, absolutely it is, James. Um, what we're doing now is just like developing the ability to keep the thumb moving no matter what the fingers are doing. And these are basically exercises and building blocks to allow you to do that. So eventually, it's it's totally unconscious. Your thumb is playing accurately. Um, but this is just a basic rhythm pattern I'm showing you uh, and a great exercise for your right hand. So let's look at the same thing, but this time I'm going to use what's called a muffled bass or a muted bass. And the way I'm going to get that is with the back of my palm here, kind of, kind of the side of my palm. I'm going to rest that over the D string, which is the fourth string. A string is the fifth string. E string is a sixth string. So I want to just rest that part of my hand right on what would be the saddle. In this case, it's arch top. It's a, a bridge here. But if you had an acoustic, you know, or even electric, right where the, the strings are coming over the saddle or the bridge is where you want to rest your hand. Okay. And this is where it's going to become important not to bend this knuckle as much and to keep this relationship I talked about going on. Okay. So here's the same thing. Let me just try the, the bass, just the thumb alone with the muffled bass. And you can hear the difference in tone. Just the thumb. Now when I go to the fourth string root, I have to shift that hand up a little bit. Back to G. Okay, so that's just a thumb. You can hear a much different tone than letting the note sustain. Okay, so one is not necessarily better than the other, although the muffled bass sound is definitely a characteristic of a lot of boom chick style music that you hear. So let me play the same pattern. Um, actually, let me play you a different pattern just because 
because we have some of these other patterns in the sheet available for you. Instead of pinching on beats two and four, why don't I uh, pinch on beats one and four? Okay, so again, the thumbs always play on every single beat, quarter notes, all right? And then the fingers are just gonna be manipulated to play on different beats. So I'll do two bars of G, two bars of C, two bars of D7, and finally two bars of G. Pinches on beats one and four. I'll do my best here. And I'm going to use the muffled bass so you can hear that. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, four. So that's a great beginning exercise. Uh, and this could be applied to any type of chord you want to play, uh, any chord quality, whether it's a, a triad, like what I just did, meaning three notes, or I did a D7, which is a dominant seven chord. Any type of chord you want to experiment with applying these patterns to would work. So here's an example. Um, I'll just play like an A minor seven, a D minor nine, and an E7 with a sharp flat or flat 13 back to A minor 7 just to see a different quality. Here we go. Same pattern. I didn't change the thumb. I didn't change anything besides the quality of chords and the progression that I that I chose. So, a good thing to do is experiment with different progressions um, and different ways to play the chords. Now, something to mention is that there are times where you have to modify that picking pattern that I showed you. Um, for instance, let's say I have this chord, like a, a G six nine chord. And I don't really have anything to play on this A string. So my, my six string root of going six, four, five, four is not really going to work. So this is an example of where you have to modify at times the alternating bass pattern. And this is important. I mean, this happens in real, real life when you're arranging a tune in this style or playing a tune in this style. It happens all the time. Uh, what's important is to keep the thumb alternating in whatever way you can and still trying to stick with playing the root on the first B like we did. So let's say I had this G6-9 chord. What I'm going to do instead of 6-4-5-4 four, four, is just repeat 6-4-6-4, six, four, six, four. those two strings only. And then I'm going to A minor 7. Same thing, just going six four six four. So uh, once again, when you put this into real life situation and you're working on maybe arranging a tune like we're going to talk about uh, in a little bit, you're going to have to employ these modifications um, at times. Basically, we just want to make sure root for now on beat one is important and then keep the thumb moving. So yeah, this is a good, thank you, Stephen. This is a good tutorial. Again, for beginners, you know, we're just developing some of the basics uh, and we're going to take off from there. So anybody have any any questions on what we've done so far? If not, that's that's totally fine too. No questions are, are okay. I just want to check in. Um, and any related questions too, feel free to ask uh, as I go along. That's one of the great things about the live session is you can, you know, we can ask, we can uh, interact a bit, you can ask some questions. So that's a, a good place to start. If you've never done much of the boomstick style thing, the first thing you want to do is develop the right hand, uh, the thumb independence and the finger independence. Let me show you a little bit more complex pattern. Um, this one is not on the sheet that you can download, but it'll be archived here on this video, and, and I'm always happy to, to show you it at some point too. So why don't I take... Um, why don't I just take this, the first basic chords we had, G, C, D7 again, which is nice because it gives us a sixth string root chord, fifth string root, and a fourth string root. 
So now what we're going to do is add a little bit of syncopation. And this is the next thing you want to practice uh, with the right hand patterns is add in syncopation. Because so far, we're just playing everything right on the beat on the quarter notes. Um, one of the, the first patterns to, to do with syncopation to practice goes like this. Remember, the thumbs always staying on the quarter notes. That's not going to change. Okay. And what we're going to do now is a thumb on the, the beat one, sixth string, pinch with all the fingers and the thumb on beat two, the thumb on beat three. Now on the and of beat three, the upbeat in between beat three and beat four is just the fingers, index, middle, and ring. And then beat four is the thumb, just like it would always do. So the thumb is this consistent, you know, almost like your metronome, bass player and, and rhythm guitar player that's keeping everything else in line. So that will always be happening. So here's that pattern again. Thumb, beat one, pinch on beat two, all the fingers and thumb. Beat three is just the thumb on the fifth string. Now in the and of beat three, fingers. Beat four is the thumb. So here it is again. I'm going to um, muffle the bass strings and just play it on the, the G chord, which has the six string root. Okay, here we go. So we have this little bit of syncopation now uh, between beats three and four, which makes it a little bit more rhythmically active and interesting. So let me just do that same thing, uh, the same pattern that is, over our, our three basic chords here in the key of G. Again, two bars on G, two bars on C, two bars on D7, and two bars on G. All right, here we go. One, two, three, and four. So again, it's one of those things that sometimes is deceptive and that it sounds pretty easy and simple, but when you go to do it, it's kind of hard to keep the thumb going. So once again, in order to play finger style pieces, uh, it's good to have the underlying techniques down first. It'll it'll make your life a lot easier uh, if you go to learn a Tommy Emmanuel piece or Chet Atkins or Joe Robinson or Tom Bresh or you know, Jerry Reed, et cetera. If you are kind of already hip to some of the techniques they use and your hands are used to doing them, uh, it's so much more easy and efficient than learning the, the technique as you learn the tune. It's just a, a lot harder to do it that way. So let me show you the same pattern with a different uh, chord progression. And we'll move on to some more interesting patterns. And once again, feel free to ask any questions if you have any. So here's that same progression I did a minute ago. I'm going to do, this is an A minor ninth. Okay. So I'm just using the open E and open B string. My root's on the fifth string for this. And I'm going to go to a D minor ninth. Root's also on the fifth string. And when I play this chord, I'm going to rock down to the sixth string when my thumb goes there on the right hand to play this A. Okay, that's it. so I can alternate that note down. And then once again, I'm going to play this E7 with the flat 13. So I'm doing kind of a partial bar there, getting that C, G sharp, D, B, E, six string root there. Okay, so here's the muffled bass we talked about. Again, just this part of my hand on the, the bass three strings. And then I'm going to go ahead and play that pattern with the syncopation between beats three and four. Okay, two bars on each chord. Well, one, two, three, and four.
again, just you can tell just by changing the chord progression and the quality of the chords, it has a completely different flavor, although I haven't really changed anything on the right hand. My thumb's still doing the boom chick, and I'm doing the, the given pattern, okay? So let's take this uh, one step further. Let's make the, the rhythm pattern a little bit more intricate, a little bit more rhythmically active, and a little more rhythmically interesting. So we're gonna add some more syncopation, and we're also going to split up the fingers. Okay, so uh, how do you, let's see, we got, a, we got a question from James here. How do you think one that learns the boomstick finger style can transition to slide guitar? That's a good question. Uh, I don't play a lot of slide guitar, but from most slide guitarists that I've watched, they use a finger style technique and uh, they have, you know, the great players have great independence between thumb and fingers. And again, that's what we're trying to develop here is finger and thumb independence. Um, again, you have to kind of use your imagination to see, you know, right now I'm showing you the basic raw technique. Um, and you have to imagine that being employed in a real life situation, which we're going to, we're working up to. But I think that these sorts of techniques help your finger independence, dexterity, your tone, dynamics, everything with your right hand that you would need for slide plane. So I think you could use any of these for slide plane. Um, so let's get back to this new pattern. I'm gonna demonstrate it. This time I'm just gonna, I don't know why I chose that random progression, but I'm gonna stick with the A minor nine. Okay, so the root's on the fifth string. So my thumb's going five, four, six, four, five, four, six, four. Okay, now here's the pattern beat by beat, right? Thumb's on all the quarter notes, every beat the thumb's playing. Beat one is just the thumb. Beat two is the thumb, index, middle, and ring finger all together, just like we've done on our other patterns. Now, beat three is the thumb on the sixth string. And on the end of beat three, this time it's just going to be the index finger on the third string. Okay? Beat four is the thumb on the fourth string. And the end of beat four, the upbeat between beats four and one, are the ring finger and middle finger on the second and first string. Okay, so middle fingers on the second string, ring fingers on the first string. So the pattern's gonna sound like this. One, two, three, and four, and one, two, three, and four, and. Okay, so again, a little bit more rhythmically active than the very first boom chick pattern we started with. Although the thumb, the thumb is still doing a boom chick style pattern itself, okay? So let me just play this pattern for you really slow. Once again, to summarize, thumb on beat one, fifth string. Beat two, pinch with all the fingers and the thumb. Beat three, thumb on the sixth string. The and of beat three is the index finger on the third string. The fourth beat is the thumb on the fourth string. And the and of beat four is middle and ring finger on the second and first string. Okay, so again, now we're starting to split up the fingers. We have syncopation. Let me play that same progression I did a minute ago. A minor nine, D minor nine, E seven with the flat 13, back to A minor nine with this more syncopated pattern. I'll do it for the first time without muffling the bass and the second time I'll muffle the bass, okay? And you can hear the difference. One, two, three, and four, and. Bass. Okay, so once again, a little bit more interesting sound and pattern uh, built from those same fundamentals. So one more time, here it is uh, with a little more heat to it um, so you can hear sometimes these patterns sound dramatically different too depending on the tempo uh, and also the dynamic level so if i'm playing really soft and really sweet and slow this is 
certain feel compared to if I'm really digging in with the right hand uh, and playing with more speed. So just for fun, here it is with a little more speed. Just for fun right it doesn't necessarily make it better just because it's faster uh, but again I want you to hear the difference when you you add a little more uh, increase the tempo a little bit to the pattern that is so we're hey bunny how you doing oh good we're getting a lot of good uh, comments from people any any questions anybody has any time is a good time to to, uh, <laughs> to ask them and yeah let's move on here from from some of these patterns I just want to, to demonstrate some of those things because Oftentimes um, they get overlooked, and the thumb is such an important driving force with finger style. So as we, we we move towards kind of looking at an actual tune, you'll see that having these fundamentals down and having your thumb like totally unconscious to play the the root on beat one, etc., is is a really important thing. Okay, so we we want to keep that up. For more patterns, uh, you got this sheet you can you can get from the link um, that Jeff posted from TrueFire, and then uh, I've got some more of these type of patterns in my fingerstyle survival guide course. So let's move on. Why don't we look at um, some tips. I'm gonna give you some tips here that I think are important when not only performing like an existing fingerstyle piece, um, but especially if you're working on arranging a, a simple fingerstyle piece that is, or composing a simple fingerstyle piece. Um, there are some important tips I can give you that have helped me a lot. And one of the things that's, that's uh, sometimes misunderstood is with so many finger style pieces, the left hand actually uh, is somewhat static. Not necessarily static, but a lot of times a whole bar or two bars or three bars or four bars of music will be contained within maybe one chord shape or one grip. Uh, whereas sometimes if you're reading the notation or the tab or listening, it's hard to it's hard to just pick that up without someone telling you. So in general, I would say if you're working on a cover of someone's fingerstyle piece or you're arranging your own fingerstyle piece uh, or composing something, you want to look for efficiency with the left hand. Um, and yeah, just seeing how much stuff you can get contained within one chord shape on a minimum amount of movement. Okay, so let's see. I can't play any examples of Mississippi John Hurt. I'm sorry there, James. Um, yeah, I can't do any of that, although I think that these things are somewhat related. But I will play you an example of um, some more Bone Chick style stuff here in a minute. So I, I started the session by playing a piece that I wrote called uh, Midnight Vagabond. And the first few phrases go like this. Let's kind of break down a little bit what's going on. I'm just going to try to give you some insight into what I was thinking uh, as I'm writing this piece. And, and most of it came from just using my ear and trying to keep the thumb moving while playing some sort of interesting melody and something that wasn't too terribly difficult to play. So, and this is, I'm just trying to demonstrate that point of, um, you know, your melody and chords and everything sometimes can be contained within a simple chord shape versus trying to break things up and move all around. Sometimes it's as simple as putting down uh, one chord form or chord shape to get everything you need. So the thumb on this A minor, just to show you a few bars of this tune, the thumb's doing our fifth string alternating bass pattern. Five, four, six, four, five, four, six, four, because the root's on the fifth string, if we play it in this particular position. Okay, and then the melody is really just kind of an arpeggio of the chord. Uh, that's really the melody that's going on. So if I put that with the bass, okay, and 
again, that's when I'm thinking about writing a a boom chick style tune. You know, that's not something crazy or pushing the envelope or something. I just wanted to have a, a nice good chord sound. I'm just using all these chord tones that are built right there into the shape and keeping the thumb going. Now I do add my my little finger here on G, which is still a, a chord tone of the chord. It's kind of an inversion now with G. It's like A minor over G. So I add that in for a little bit of, of bass motion. And when I do that, uh, I have to modify the bass pattern like I talked about. So when I go to the, the G, I bring it down also to an, to an F sharp, A minor over F sharp, which is kind of like an F sharp minor 7 flat 5 chord. But again, I'm just trying to put some motion in the bass. So I have to modify, as I explained before, I'm just going 6, 4, 6, 4. But I'm keeping the bass playing quarter notes the whole time. So we have A minor, A minor over G, A minor over F sharp, or F sharp minor 7, 5, 5. And then I go down to an F major 7 with the open E string. And thumbs playing this F down here, which is a Merle Travis and many other players type of trick. So here it is again. Again, just a thumb. And then I go to an E7 with the sharp fifth there again, or flat 13. Okay, this is kind of a cool chord. Back to A. So I'm just trying to demonstrate the bass motion only. And I'm playing also with what I would call a little bit heavier of a thumb, where I'm brushing the, the fourth string and a little bit of the third string to get some more of the chord sound, the chord tones in there as I play this. So here's just the thumb again, muffled thumb. And I'm trying to start with the root of the chord, or if there's an inversion, like when I play A minor over G, sometimes the whatever the bass note is, is played on the first beat. So again, another modification from what we talked about with the, the root always being on the first beat. So here's the thumb. Okay, so here's what the melody sounds like. Okay, let me do it one more time. Now check out also my left hand is not playing these chords in like little pieces. I'm just keeping the chord shape down. and Everything I need is contained within that. And again, that's kind of a, a golden rule that sometimes um, is not obvious and that's understandable. But it's something you want to consider when you're, when you're working on a tune uh, of any sort is what's the most efficient way you can get all the notes with the least amount of movement in the left hand. Uh, and as I said, so many finger style pieces have this built into them, um, and it's something definitely to be aware of. So here's the melody again. So uh, let's see. That's just an arpeggio on the A minor. Then a little hammer on from the C up to the D note. And then I changed my F major seven. The melody notes E there. Now here for this E7 flat 13 or sharp 5, whatever you want to call it, I'm doing a pull off from the fourth fret to the third fret. So that's like E flat down to D on the B string. And then my melody's there, the ring finger. So once again, just the melody. You can do all this with just your first finger. Okay, here's with the bass. One more time. Okay, anybody, any questions about that process at all? Um, again, I'm just trying to show kind of the thinking process is 
is picking a chord progression, you know, it could be anything, and seeing what sort of melody you can get from kind of the built-in notes from the chord forms. That's a good starting place. If you've, if you've never tried to, you know, compose a simple tune in the Boom Chick style, this is a really easy way to get started. Uh, the other thing that can be an advantage, let's see, Bunny's asking, good question, Bunny, how many total sequences, full A minor, then moving bass through A minor, then F D seven one sequence? Um, well, what I do, I'll show you. So I'm going to play a slightly varied phrase next in the actual tune. Um, this is just like the first... Uh, Think the first eight bars, and then I go up here to a an A minor seven. So it's just kind of like what I did here, but I'm using an inversion of the same chord. And that that's a great question, Bunny, because it brings me kind of to another point I want to make is is having a vocabulary of multiple ways to play the same chord or um, knowing a vocabulary of different types of chord qualities and inversions, which there are so many great courses uh, on TrueFire covering chords, covering inversions. Um, I mean, there's resources out there, obviously, beyond TrueFire, too, and a lot of ways you can learn this stuff. But if you're wanting to, like, arrange simple sorts of arrangements for fingerstyle guitar or write your own sort of stuff, having a grasp on inversions can be really helpful. And that's, for me, a tool that I use all the time. It's it's a simple tool. Uh, for example, I played the first sequence that Bunny was asking about. Okay, now instead of just repeating that, I want a different phrase. And instead of rethinking an entire new chord progression, maybe I go back to this A minor chord, but I want to play it somewhere different which automatically, this is an A minor 7. Just based on where I'm playing it on the neck offers up some different possibilities for what my melody notes can be. And again, I when I wrote this particular tune, I'm not really thinking in a theoretical way so much. I'm just thinking, okay, there's A minor. I want to play another A minor chord. Um, this time an A minor 7th. I could have just done an A minor triad. It's fine too. And then what I'll do is I'll start to experiment. What are what are the built-in melody notes that I could have? Okay, that's the same rhythmic pattern. Um, maybe I just play, you know. Again, any combination you come up with will work, but I'll start to experiment what's available built into this chord shape. Um, and what I ultimately ended up doing was using one of my free fingers. So I play this A minor seven. And I've got these three fingers here that could be doing a possibility of, of different things, right? And so what I did was use the little finger. So I'm playing sort of a melody with the little finger, the, the fourth finger. Then open E string. And again, I didn't necessarily do that out of thinking in a theoretical way or about a particular scale. I was just experimenting what's, what's close by. Okay, and, and in doing that, I hit a lot of sour notes uh, <laughs> that didn't sound so good either. But anyways, that helped me get there. So let's look at that next section. I went, came down to the F major seven again. Okay. It could have ended up being any melody. just made that up right because I'm just experimenting what's available and that's what you have to do you have to basically dig in and see an experiment right till you find the right thing so I'm looking at some comments here real quick um, built in a custom telly cut in the okay um, any advice on choosing a thumb pick yeah I mentioned early on in the the session here i use a thumb pick called a fred kelly thumb pick ultimately you want to use what's comfortable this is called a slick pick i use the heavy size and yeah that's my little bit of advice um something that's comfortable it's not going to cut off the circulation of your thumb everybody has a different preference but i go with the fred kelly's so anyways that's my advice on the thumb pick 
So let's go back to this idea. Again, I'm still thinking like A minor is sort of the chord I want, but I've just tried an inversion. I could have tried, you know, all sorts of different inversions that could offer me different notes, right? Um, so that's one of the reasons, as I mentioned, getting a little grasp on some of the chord vocabulary can be really helpful. Um, and again, this is coming at it from sort of a experimental composition sort of um, perspective, right? Choosing a chord progression. So earlier I played the same sort of progression, A minor 9, D minor 9, E7, flat 13, back to A minor and E7. So even if I just had those three chords, you know, I in my first chord, I noticed I have like, index and and pinky available so then i would start to experiment there's all sorts of possibilities i could have for my melody there okay and again i'm keeping the thumb going that's what really keeps the tune driving is the thumb then the same sort of thing i get to the d minor nine well here i'm using all my fingers so that i might start to, to experiment with what happens when i start to subtract uh, embellishments things like hammer-ons okay and then i go to my and again i'm just showing you like a basic thought process of composing a really simple finger style piece um, it's almost easier than it should be in a way of just holding down a chord, keep the bass going, and experiment with what you can find with the melody. Um, there's no right or wrong when you do this, so it just take some perseverance and time to get in there and find something that sounds good. One thing to mention is, again, the thumb is playing the kind of the, the basic bass part and the rhythm guitar part. And mo most often in these type of arrangements that we're talking about, the basic boom chick, sort of stuff your melody is going to be on the top three strings to begin with let's say okay that doesn't have to always be that way but i should mention as i'm you know working through these these things i'm showing you that's what i'm always considering is what what are my melody notes kind of on the first second and third strings uh which stays out of the way of the bass and you're going to have it in a higher register um than you would normally have so again from this little progression we have i would think of what are my possible notes? Again, I'm totally randomly choosing these things. And then the D minor nine. Okay, and then I get down here to E7, and I would just say what's available. It doesn't necessarily have to be always adding something to the chord or taking something away either. It could just be something that's built into the chord. That's the melody. It's already built into the shape. Okay. <laughs> so the idea here, again, is just giving you some tips on, um, you know, food for thought for basic arranging or com composition that is too for really simple finger style type of stuff. Um, let's see. I'm going to, Stephen, the same as you. Okay. looks like. People are liking the Fred Kelly picks. That's great. Uh, any other questions about anything related? Or I can I'm going to keep going on. If not, no problem. If there's no questions, but I'm happy to to answer any questions there may be. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's see here. Let me play you a little bit more of that tune I just played, just to demonstrate again. And notice how much of the melody is contained within the chord shapes, right? I'm not jumping around all over the place. Um, I'm just kind of starting with a basic chord shape that's familiar for me. And again, the more, the deeper your vocabulary of, of chords, then the more possibilities you're gonna have uh, when you're arranging something or you're composing something. So um, yeah, at the same time, you can keep it simple and maybe only know a few chords and it can be an absolutely great piece as well. So um, it doesn't have to be more chords equals better. 
Okay, here we go again with a little example of this. I'm just going to use thumb and index finger for all of this with the right hand. Now, you could use any combination you want, but just to show you that even using thumb and one finger, you can get um, bass kind of chords and melody all at one time. So once again, so good. Someone just asked, do you have a true fire course on this stuff? Why, yes, I do. <laughs> so I did a true fire course, the most recent one. I've done two true fire courses. The most recent one was called um, Boom Chick Fingerstyle Etudes, right? So it's actually 10 tunes. This is one of the tunes that's included on there. Uh, 10 tunes that utilize Boom Chick style. And yeah, they're great pieces. Some of them, there's five tunes I wrote and five old, really old standards on there as well. So yeah, that's that's available. Um, so let me let me kind of think of some more important tips that you might consider if you are arranging a tune. And again, I'm I'm giving you this sort of perspective, thinking back on okay, when I was putting together the uh, essentials, the Boom Chick course, you know, I had to think about these things. I had to write five tunes just from scratch using the boom chick style and then arrange five simple tunes, old standards as well. So some of the things I consider that are, that are important, I think, if you're writing a tune or arranging a simple finger style tune is uh, the key which, which the tune is in is important um, because relating back to this efficiency of the left hand, uh, oftentimes with these simple boom chick tunes, you want to use open strings, right? So any any key where you can utilize the open strings for either the bass notes or the melody is a good idea. Uh, it'll make life a little bit easier than using like a sharp or a flat key. Although sometimes, um, me personally, I will purposely do something uh, in a, an odd key just to force myself to make up something new. But I think that goes a little bit outside of the realm of what we're talking about with these boom chick tunes. Um, the other thing is kind of considering the range. If you're if you're writing a tune or you're making an arrangement of a tune, um, considering you know how high is the highest note you're going to need to get, how high is the lowest note, figuring out how to where to play that on the neck. Uh, as we all know, being guitar players, it's one of the beautiful things about guitar, and one of the frustrating things is there are so many ways to play the same thing, and how do you know which one is right? Um, it's different for, for everyone, really. I think uh, what everyone sounds the best, feels the best, and uh, is the most efficient to play is, is maybe a good place to look. So let's, let's check out another example from the uh, Boom Chick Essentials course. So one of the tunes that I, uh, another one of the tunes that I did was uh, an old standard called Careless Love. So the melody goes like this. clam in there somewhere sorry about that you might recognize this tune it's it's a um a great traditional standard that's been around a long time so this was one of the ones i i like the song a lot it's a simple tune um not a lot of chords 
not a big crazy melody going on. So this is one of the ones that I arranged for the the Boom Chicks course. And I, I don't remember right now if I had to change the key, but what I did basically listen to some some old recordings of it. I found a few different uh, lead sheets, which would have the melody and the, some chords suggestions, uh, which aren't always accurate. Sometimes they are, but it's good to use if you can a combination of any resources you can find, audio, video, people playing things, lead sheets, etc. Uh, and so what I try to do, and this was kind of the fun challenge, it's just a big puzzle of how do you play the melody and some of the chord sound and the bass at the same time. And that's the challenge, um, I guess, when arranging some of these finger style pieces. So the first thing I sort of did was was try to, okay, what are the chords? And the, the first few, like the first four bars is just an E chord. So I, I kind of thought, okay, E, and I maybe started down here. And I thought, well, where's the melody? Uh, it's this G sharp note. And again, this kind of has to do with the range. Um, I could have played it down here with that G sharp, but I want the, the melody a little bit higher, um, higher register. So for me to play this E and stretch didn't really work. This is where I have to go to the bank of possible chord vocabulary, right, and inversions. And I remembered, okay, I had this kind of C shape from the cage sort of method. That gives me an E. E major. And wow, look at that. The melody is right there on top. And I can, it's in the key of E. Is the key I chose to arrange it in. So I can use the open E string. So once again, this is kind of a, a puzzle, right? And it just takes experimenting to figure out the most efficient way to play chords and melody at the same time. But let's just look at the first few bars. So I went E up here, like in the fourth position. All right, there's the first few bars, or the first bar. One, two, three, four. Okay. And actually this, this particular chart that I'm looking at is online. You can download this. Um, Jeff's put the link there a couple times. Um, this and the pattern sheet, and some of the patterns I did, are available to you to download that if you want. And anyways, that's what I'm, I'm looking at to check here. So I got the E. Now the next chord is a B7. That's the melody. Okay, well I know how to play a B7 here. But it's again a kind of a crazy stretch and jumping around a lot to do it with this particular position. So then I just had to go, you know, and figure out one possible solution of the puzzle, which there are multiple ways you could um, you could handle these sorts of things. But I ended up playing the B7 with a bar chord, right? Still the same chord, but now I have the melody built into the chord shape and easy to play position. Okay, and then I actually went down to get the next melody note to this B7, first position. So it's a combination. I'm going... So it's jumping from here, down here, back to the B7, second position. And that melody is built right into the chord shape. And then to E. Okay, so the first four bars, again, the melody is going... And I'm playing it with a full chord form, even though I'm not playing this. And this allows me to play the bass. So I'm able to keep my thumb alternating and play the melody at the same time. So here's the first four bars. So you'll see when I play the B7, the jump right there in the middle of the bar on the second beat. One, two, three, four, to E. Again. Okay, now the next part of the melody um, is up here. And again, you could play this. 
you could play it on the first string, right, and figure out a way to solve the puzzle, how to play the chords and the melody at the same time. I just slid up to an E, that was the chord. I just did an E up here on the ninth position. And then really efficiently and easy, there's a C sharp seven to F sharp minor seven, or excuse me, F sharp seven right there within reach. And then I played a, a, B, a B9 here to get me back down to this position. So once again, I didn't automatically just go to this right away. It took some experimenting. And again, the, the whole idea that I'm trying to show is uh, basically figuring out the puzzle when you're arranging Again, like this tune, very simple tune, very few chord changes, simple melody, which is a good place to start. Um, and then it's about figuring out a way to play it. And there's no one way to do it. Um, there's a lot of ways to get to the solution, uh, and they're all going to sound different. So once again, having a good steady technique with the right hand, uh, being able to unconsciously just have the thumb playing, um, having a good vocabulary of left hand chords, will really help and assist you when you're going to arrange something like this. So any, let me just check in with everybody here. Anybody have any uh, kind of last questions? Because we're going to actually be wrapping up our, our live session here so I can do my homework. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Any last questions? I am going to play you this tune, Careless Love, like the simple arrangement uh, from the Boom Chick course to kind of close it out so you can hear what that sounds like. And I, I thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. And I hope it was helpful. I mean, I just kind of had some ideas of what to talk about and, and just went for it. So thanks for your for your questions. Um, doesn't look like anyone's asking anything, which is great, too. It's fine. So why don't I play you um, this Careless Love piece <clears throat> and another piece, uh, um, a little... Another piece of information to try out is this first time I'm going to play through the whole piece, just like it's written really straight ahead, like mainly all quarter notes. Uh, but something you can do to add some interest into the piece would be to start adding some of the syncopation like we did with a few of the the patterns. OK, so let me go ahead and, and give it a shot here for you. Careless love. syncopation Again, uh, probably not the most complex finger style arranging you've ever heard, uh, but it's not intended to, to be so, right? These are things, once again, just trying to either maybe compose something simple or arrange something simple, uh, being able to use the thumb, playing the whole time quarter notes, playing some chord sound, right? With them, like I mentioned, sometimes just getting the fourth and third string with the thumb, or maybe you know, the fingers, index, middle, maybe are getting a few chord tones, and the melody often on the first, second, or third string. Um, experimenting with how do you get all those things to happen at one time. So the Essentials course kind of covers uh, 10 tunes that, that do that kind of thing. But I would say for any of you out there, try that as an example. Try coming up with a simple progression. It can be two chords, three chords, 30 chords, whatever you want, any particular key and see if you can come up with a smooth sounding melody 
um, like I talked about and demonstrated with no, uh, notes that are built into the chord, chord tones, or what's available by adding a finger, um, a hammer on, a slide, a pull off, maybe you take off a finger. And yeah, once again, just experiment with it, have some fun with it. Um, and I'm always available for, for some questions. I have a website, brooksrobertson.com. I teach a lot of lessons with True Fire. I've got the, the two courses with True Fire, the Fingerstyle Survival Guide, and the Essentials Boom Chick Fingerstyle Etudes course, as well as do a lot of um, Skype lessons and that kind of thing. So thank you all so much for joining me tonight. Uh, it was really fun to get to, to talk to some of you, and I hope I answered any, um, any questions you had. Um, and please join us again for another True Fire Live event in the future. All right, everyone. Have a great night. <laughs> Thank you. I'll see. We've got some good thank yous coming in here. Oh, good. All right, Stephen. All right, Bunny. Take care, you guys. Bye.